welcome you to our program. The title of this broadcast is entitled The Offense of the Cross. We're going to be analyzing this topic in this broadcast together, but before we do, let us pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide us. Dear Father in heaven, help us to understand the offense of the cross, what it is that could possibly be offensive about what Jesus did in our behalf, and help us to submit ourselves to that cross as we see what Jesus did for us. Please guide us in this broadcast together that we would be prepared for the times coming upon this world and for the second coming of Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. The place where we find this phrase, the offense of the cross, is found in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 11. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 11, and we read, And I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So Paul recognized that if he preached circumcision or another means whereby a person could be saved, other than through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, then Paul said the offense of the cross would cease. The cross would cease to be offensive if there was another means whereby a person could save himself. We've analyzed in the book of Galatians that this is Paul's whole argument and the whole problem that he faced with the churches of Galatia. And it's certainly a problem that we see today is that people are trying to find a means, some mechanism other than through the cross of Christ whereby a person can be saved. We notice in the book Desire of Ages that whenever a group of people seek to find some mechanism whereby they can save themselves other than through Christ, they have built up a system of works and when that is in a person's life, they have no barrier to resist sin. In Desire of Ages, pages 35 and 36, Ellen White says this, By contemplating and worshiping their own conceptions, the heathen had lost a knowledge of God and had become more and more corrupt. So it was with Israel, God's professed people, the principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle. Wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. That was the system that was established in Judaism at the time of Christ's first coming. A principle whereby man could save himself other than through faith in Jesus Christ. And we find that after the cross, Paul preached to the people of Galatia because the Jews that believed, you remember in Acts 15 and verse 1, Jews that believed, came into the Galatian churches and said, unless you are circumcised, you cannot be saved. And so Paul says, if I preach circumcision, why do I yet suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. So circumcision had supplanted righteousness by faith. In Jesus Christ and that we find happening today we find so many different ideas out there that are set up as a means whereby people can gain salvation now there are a lot of honest people that hold these particular views that I'm going to discuss and they don't force them down other people's throats but when a person says, unless you do this certain thing, 
you cannot be saved. Then that person has embraced a principle called salvation by works that Paul so stringently opposed in the Galatian churches. We find today people saying that unless you embrace the idea that the Holy Spirit is not a part of the Godhead, unless you embrace the idea that Jesus is less than one with his Father, then you can't be saved. Then that person is saying that salvation comes through that doctrine of the Godhead. And everything pivots around that belief. Friends, that has become circumcision for that person. If somebody says, unless you accept only the original writings of Ellen G. White, you cannot be saved. That person has embraced the original writings of Ellen White as a salvational doctrine that unless you accept only the original writings, then you are a lost person. There are those out there today. I just received a document in the, in, the, in the mail from a gentleman who was advocating very strongly the belief in the feast days, which Paul said in Colossians 2 were a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. This gentleman was saying that unless you keep the feast days, you cannot be saved. The feast days become an issue of salvation. And when all of those become issues of salvation, then the offense of the cross ceases. There are others out there today that stringently hold that unless you use the name of Yahweh when you say the name of God, that you cannot be saved. I was given a book recently by a precious, precious Christian lady in our church. And it had to do with this idea of Yahweh. Now she did it in such a gracious and kind way because she wanted me to try to understand this message. But she, has, she never proposed it to be a, an issue of salvation. She just simply wanted me to study it, to arrive at my own conclusion. And I said I'd be glad to. But I found it so interesting in the book that the author makes it very, very clear over and over again that salvation is found in the name of Yahweh. There's another belief out there today, two more that I can think of. One is that there is salvation in a church. I've had people that come to our church here in Florida and they say, you know, Bill, since we don't go to a conference church anymore, the people look at us and say, well, if you don't go to a conference church, you're not saved. And then I hear people in independent ministries who say, unless you're separated from the conference, Unless your names are removed from the books of the denomination, you're lost. And the only salvation is found in being totally separated from the denomination. Now, I personally do not have my name on denominational books, but that is not what will save me from my sins. That simply is a personal choice of mine that I choose not to have anything to do with a denomination in abject apostasy. Finally, there are those out there today who feel so strongly about the name of Seventh-day Adventists that if you unless you are called by the name Seventh-day Adventist, you can't be saved. God help us. Not one of those doctrines that I have just declared, the feast days, the issue of the Godhead, the issue of God's name, the issue of the original writings, 
the issue of in the church or out of the church, in the denomination or out of the denomination, however you want to say it. And the issue of the name. Not one single one of those doctrines can help me in my battle with sin. Not any one of those doctrines is going to protect me and shield me when the devil attacks me unmercifully to seek to destroy my soul. But there is one. There is one doctrine, there is one belief that can save me when I am willing to submit to its power. And that is the belief and the abiding trust in the power of Jesus Christ to save me from my sins. And only as I am willing to trust in Jesus Christ and Him alone can I find the power to turn away from my sins. And the Apostle Paul said, he said, if I preach circumcision or I preach feast days or I preach name of God or I preach original writings or whatever it is, if I make that an issue of salvation, then the offense of the cross has ceased. What a tragic position we find the professed people of God in today. And that includes every single one of us. Because you see, for so long, the idea of the cross has been offensive to many of us. I know it has to me. I remember several years ago, almost 20 to be exact, when a professor who had been at Andrews University for many years, a very well-known, well-thought-of Seventh-day Adventist minister and doctor of theology by the name of Edward Heppenstall. He came to visit in a church in Central California to preach a Sabbath morning. And as Dr. Heppenstall got up to preach, he preached on justification by faith. And I remember throughout the message it was, look to the cross. The cross will save you. Don't worry about your life. Don't worry about your profession. Don't worry about your performance. Just look at the cross. Jesus will save you. And the idea that rang so loud and so clear in my mind as Dr. Heppenstall preached was that the cross was a, a way whereby Jesus could save me in my sins. At that very same time, I was at Pacific Union College, and a man by the name of Desmond Ford, Dr. Desmond Ford, was there, an articulate Australian, who preached the exact same thing, that Justification is something only that God declares. It's a forensic only act of God, a declarative act that God accounts to somebody in the courts of heaven. But Dr. Ford made it very clear that what God accounted to somebody in heaven, God was not able to do in that person's life here on earth. I remember a few years after that being involved in an evangelistic outreach in Northern California, about 60 miles from Pacific Union College, in a little town called Lakeport, California. And a doctor, a medical doctor, was invited to the church that particular Sabbath. And to every question that everybody asked him on that particular Sabbath, he said, just look at the cross. Look at the cross. And as this gentleman said that, I was getting absolutely sick 
in my heart and in my mind because he made the cross an all-sufficient band-aid so that I could cover over my sins and still live a wretched life of sin, sinful living. And I was nauseated by what was said. But you know, in my nauseation over Dr. Ford and Dr. Heppenstall and this medical doctor, I began to want to run away from the cross of Christ. Not to look at the cross. But you know, friends, I believe we need to look at Calvary because I believe it's at Calvary's cross that you and I can find the power to help us live a victorious Christian life. I believe at Calvary's cross you and I can find hope to say here was Jesus willing to die no matter what came his way. May God help each one of us to have that same spirit as we continue in our analysis of the offense of the cross. What could possibly be offensive? What possibly could the Apostle Paul been trying to say when he discussed the offense of the cross? In the book, The Glad Tidings, page 113, E.J. Wagoner said, The cross is and always has been a symbol of disgrace. To be crucified was to be subjected to the most ignominious death known. The apostle said that if he preached circumcision, that is righteousness by works, the offense of the cross would cease. The offense of the cross is that the, that the cross is a confession of human frailty and sin and of our inability to do any good thing. To take the cross of Christ means to depend solely on Him for everything. And this is the abasement of all human pride. Men love to fancy themselves independent. But let the cross be preached. Let it be made known that in man dwells no good thing and that all must be received as a gift. And straightway, somebody is offended. So what does the cross bring out? The cross reveals to humanity today, and it screams for 2,000 years, that all you and I have inside ourselves is death. And all you and I can do for anything that is good is to destroy it. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. But how to perform that which is good, I find not. Here in this passage, the Apostle Paul identifies the offense of the cross. It says that in man dwells no good thing. Now when we analyze Jesus dying at the cross, we understand that it was not the nail prints in his hands. It wasn't the crown of thorns on his head or even the spear that was thrust through his side. It was not that that killed the Son of God. It was the sins that you and I naturally do by ourselves. It was sin, our sins, that killed the Son of God. Now at the cross, as we see Jesus dying, we, we recognize and the Bible tells us 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. We read, For he has made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Jesus didn't die at Calvary because of his sins. Jesus was perfect. And as Jesus was approaching the cross in John chapter 12, we find Jesus saying, Father, save me from this hour. I think it's John 12, 26. In John 12, 26, 27, excuse me, John 12, 27, Jesus said, Father, save me from this hour. What was it that Jesus wanted to be saved from? Jesus wanted to be saved from having all the sins placed of the world placed upon him. Jesus didn't want to see that. He had lived a life of purity. But Jesus also recognized that it was his Father's will. It was God's will that Jesus would bear the sins of humanity so that humanity could have a second chance. But Christ in his human form, he said, Father, save me from this. I don't want to bear those sins. I don't want to see rape. I don't want to see murder. I don't want to see incest and lust and violence and stealing. I don't want to see war and evil and anger. I don't want to bear that in my body. All Christ's life. He had lived a life of victory. He had lived a life of purity. And now to have all impurity and all vice and all wickedness placed upon him. He said, my pure soul cringes against that. I don't want to have anything to do with that. But Christ said, for this reason I came into the world. And then Christ breathed a prayer of submission in which he said, Father, glorify thy name. And so the offense of the cross teaches us that Jesus was willing to submit to his Father's will, even if it meant him having to die a second death, even if it meant Jesus having to go to the very depths of hell and have no hope of coming forth on the other side a conqueror. Jesus said, I'll do it anyway. I'll do it for the sake of guilty man. Jesus was so submitted to his Father's will he would even submit to the most vile and wretched that could be placed upon him in the sins of every child of humanity. Gettysburg and the death that was suffered there. The deaths at Auschwitz. The deaths in all the concentration camps throughout World War II the raping of Yugoslavian women in the early 1990s and all of the vile, awful things that have gone on all through the ages were laid upon Christ. And he knew it was his Father's will and he submitted to his Father. And friends, I believe at Calvary's cross, we see what humanity can do. Humanity only has to give to God our, wretched and our, our wretchedness and our misery. But Christ teaches us through Calvary's cross. He teaches us the only way whereby you and I can receive the power of God unto salvation. 
And that is in humble submission to the Father's will. This was the idea that Jesus taught in Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24. Jesus said, and he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. So Christ taught that if anybody was going to follow after him, they had to be willing to die to self every day. They have to be willing to say, not my will, but thy will be done. Whatever your will is, Father, for my life, may that happen, not what I want, but what you want. No matter how, may, how, how good it may look, no matter how many times we can maybe justify a wrong act that we know is wrong, but to submit it to the principles of Scripture and say, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. You see, when Jesus offered that prayer, Christ could not see through the portals of the tomb. All Jesus could see because of man's sin was the second death. He did not see the other side of the grave. In Desire of Ages, page 753, we read, Satan with his fierce temptations wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave a conqueror, tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Now I've had people challenge that statement and say, but wait a minute. Jesus told his disciples, we're going up to Jerusalem and after three days the Son of Man will rise again. And they say, oh, but he understood he would rise again. He told his disciples that many times. Yes, he did. But I don't think we realize the magnitude and the horror of the sin burden that was laid upon Christ at Calvary. Ellen White says, But now with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, Desire of Ages 753, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. At this point, let's turn over the tape for side two of the offense of the cross. The burden that Christ bore at Calvary was so deep and so dark and so overwhelming. It was for that reason that Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? In that hour of supreme anguish, Christ could not see beyond the grave. Up to that point, up to Gethsemane, yes, Jesus could see. But when the sins of humanity from Adam all the way to the end of time were laid upon Christ's shoulders, 
He could not see beyond the grave. He had no hope of coming up on the other side a conqueror. And even with that weight of sin that was laid upon him, Jesus said, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. So Christ gave, Christ gave the greatest example. So often when we think of Calvary, we say, well, Christ was our substitute at Calvary, but his life was our example. I believe Christ's death was also our example because Jesus revealed at Calvary a submission to his Father's will that would go to the second death for me and for you. He was willing to do whatever his Father asked him to do, no matter how much it hurt. And in this, Jesus Christ is our perfect example. And it's looking at and beholding Christ in what he did for us that we can find victory over sin today. Because, friends, the only way that you and I can have victory over sin is that we acknowledge what our sins have done. We acknowledge that within us dwells no good thing. And in total submission to the Father, we say, not my will, but thy will be done. Not my will but thy will be done. We so often are so very hard on the Apostle Peter because in Matthew chapter 16, Peter refused to see the cross. He refused to see human frailty and human pride that had to die. Because in Matthew 16 and verse 21, it says, From that time forth began Jesus to show his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou art an offense unto me. For thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. In Desire of Ages, page 415, we read, Peter loved his Lord, but Peter's words were not such as would be a help and solace to Jesus in the great trial before him. They were not in harmony with God's purpose of grace toward a lost world, nor with the lesson of self-sacrifice that Jesus had come to teach by his own example. Peter did not desire to see the cross in the work of Christ. Desire of Ages, page 416, Ellen White says, It was to Peter a bitter lesson, and one which he learned but slowly, that the path of Christ on earth lay through agony and humiliation. The disciples shrank from fellowship with his Lord in suffering, but in the heat of the furnace fire he was to learn its blessing. Long afterward, when his active form was bowed with the burden of years and labors, Peter wrote, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. In Desire of Ages, page 417, it says to the disciples, his words, though dimly comprehended, pointed to their submission to the most bitter humiliation. 
submission even unto death for the sake of Christ. No more complete self-surrender could the Savior's words have pictured, but all this he had accepted for them. Jesus did not count heaven a place to be desired while we were lost. He left the heavenly courts for a life of reproach and insult and a death of shame. He who was rich in heaven's priceless treasure became poor that through his poverty we might be rich. We are to follow in the path he trod. The self-sacrifice, the sympathy, the love manifest in the life of Christ are to reappear in the life of the worker for God. We're tough on Peter because we say he couldn't see and didn't want to see the cross of Christ. But that is our challenge today. As you and I look to the future, as we see events transpiring in the United States and in the United Nations, as we see governmental bodies coming together to meet to determine how to stop God's final message to this planet in Revelation chapter 18. We recognize that the experience of the cross is one we must learn today. To be able to look into the face of any and every kind of challenge the devil can throw and say, Father, not my will, but thy will be done. So often today we become crisis-centered. We focus continually on the crisis before us. And I dreadfully fear that unless we focus on the Christ behind us, we will never meet the crisis before us unless we focus on what Jesus has done and on his perfect example of submission to whatever men could throw at him, we will never be able to meet the challenge that is yet to come in this earth. In Philippians chapter 2, we read these shocking words. Starting with verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So the one who was equal to the Father from all eternity, who was equal with God, the creator of the millions of planets, the millions of galaxies throughout this incredible universe, thought it not something to be grasped, but he gave it away. He gave it away. He gave away the homage of angels and unfallen worlds. He gave away his kingly crown and his mighty glory. And it says he became a man. He became a man and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. He didn't just become a man. He went even further than that. He went to the lowest, the lowest possible place that you and I might be saved from our sins. God help each one of us to be willing to to submit to the cross of Christ, to acknowledge our human frailty, which the cross tells us, 
and our total dependence upon Jesus. I believe it's for that reason that the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, because of our frailty and our weakness, it was for that reason that the Apostle Paul in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14, he said, But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. Paul recognized that the only way that he, a sinful man, could be saved was that if he learned the lesson of submission at the cross. The only way that Paul could be delivered from the carnal man that he was, was if that old man of sin died, if he was crucified every single day. And it was for that reason that the Apostle Paul said, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. In Galatians 2 and verse 20, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. How did Paul say he now lived? In going from one crisis to the next? No. He said, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And what kind of faith did the Son of God have? He had the kind of faith that would say, Father, I don't care what is going on around me. I don't care how depressing it is. I don't care how many trials, how many temptations, how many struggles, and how awful and impossible it looks. I'm still going to trust you. These were the words of the man called Job. I was telling my children about his story the other night. In Job chapter 13 and verse 15, as Job watched his lands and his homes and his family and his life withering away, in Job chapter 13 and verse 15, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Those are the triumphant words of the man of faith called Job. And that will be the voice of the people of the 144,000. They will say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Where is your faith today, dear friend? It is now in this time of preparation to be thinking about where we stand with Christ. Are we learning daily of Christ's self-sacrificing life? Are we learning daily to trust Him and to give up, to admit our sinfulness, and to rely upon Christ and his righteousness? Are we still fighting and struggling and hoping to save ourselves from our own sins and daily meeting with defeat? Friends, look to Christ. Look to Jesus, our perfect example who was willing to say, Father, whatever your will is, may it be done in me today. May our prayer, may our heart cry be the cry 
of the man from us. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. And as we make that our heartfelt cry and our earnest prayer, we will then learn, at least to a degree, something about the offense of the cross. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for the cross that's a divine remedy to take away sin from a frail human being. It's offensive if we want to save ourselves. It's offensive if we want to be self-righteous and proud. But it's power unto salvation. It's the victory that overcomes the world for those that are saved who live by the faith of the Son of God. Strengthen each one of us to that end. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we close out this tape, I'd like to share with you a little song. It's called Embrace the Cross. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me. Embrace the cross where Jesus suffered. Though it may cost all you claim as yours, your sacrifice may seem small, Beside the treasure, eternity can't measure what Jesus holds in store. Embrace the love the cross requires. Cling to the one whose heart knew every pain. Receive from Jesus fountains of compassion, for only he can fashion your heart to move as his. Embrace the life that comes from dying. Come trace the steps the Savior walked for you. An empty tomb concludes Golgotha's sorrow. Endure until tomorrow your cross of suffering. Embrace the cross. Embrace the cross. The cross of Jesus. To each one of us today, God has given us a cross so that we, we might learn the principle of dying to self each and every day 
so that only Christ would be formed within the hope of glory.